Paramyscus polyanotus is often referred to as the old field mouse, and that's because throughout much of its range in the southeastern U.S., as seen here, so Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and northern Florida, it occurs in um, these old fields, which are really overgrown agricultural fields. Um, now, throughout most of its range, it may look to you like a typical mouse. It's got a dark brown coat, um, a gray scruffy belly, and a striped tail. But what's particularly interesting to us about these mice is that they've recently invaded um, these sandbar um, islands and sandy dune habitats on the Gulf Coast of Florida, as well as the uh, Atlantic Coast of Florida. So each one of these numbers on this map refers to a different subspecies of what I'll refer to as beach mice, because the mice actually live on the beach. Now, the first part of the story, I'm going to focus on one of these subspecies, here number three, and that is the Santa Rosa Island beach mouse. So let me show you a picture of their habitat. So unlike their mainland counterparts that live in dark, loamy soils, these mice live on these beautiful um, sandy islands um, off the Gulf Coast of Florida. And here's a picture of one of our um, field sites. So you'll notice that there are two dramatic differences in habitat that these mice occupy. So first, you can tell that there's um, the soil, in this case, this um, granulated um, sand that's almost like walking on hills of granulated sugar is much lighter in color than the dark loamy soils of the mainland subspecies. But in addition, um, th these uh, beach habitats also have much less vegetative cover, so these mice are exposed to really high levels of predation, and I'll tell you more about their predators in a minute. So it may not be surprising then when we go out and catch mice in these beautiful um, beaches, the mice look different. So here's a picture of one of those beach mice. And I should mention this is not to scale. So both of these mice are about the same size, and they're about the size of a ping pong ball. But what this slide does serve to illustrate is the dramatic differences in pigmentation. So this particular mouse, you can see, is lacking pigment on its nose, on its sides. And if you could see the tail, it's also missing that strong tail stripe. The other thing I want to mention to you about this system is that we know something about the geological age of these um, islands. They're about 6,000 years old which suggests that the difference in coat color that you see here may have evolved in just a few thousand years. So you may all be thinking that this makes perfect sense, right? These mice are running around in these beautiful white sand beaches, and having a light colored coat um, would make them more camouflaged. And that's a great idea, but we wanted to actually prove that. So as scientists, what we wanted to do is empirically demonstrate that color matters for survival, so actually do an experiment. We want to know how much it matters. In other words, we want to estimate the strength of selection. How favorable is it to actually match the background? And then finally, we wanted to know the agent of the selection. Who, who's doing the selection? And in this case, who are the predators? So first, I want to tell you then about um, the experiments we did to try to make this link between color variation and the differences in environment the mice live in, and in particular, implicate a role for natural selection. Now, if I could do any experiment uh, in the world, here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to catch, let's say, 100 light mice and 100 dark mice, maybe give them all a tag, and let's say release half of them equal numbers of light and dark and dark habitat, the other half equal numbers of light and dark in light habitat, and then come back, let's say, a few months later and see who survived. And I'd have the expectation that mice that are lighter would survive better in light habitat and those that are darker better in dark habitat. Now, for a number of reasons, that experiment is quite hard to do. Um, so instead, what we did is what I would argue is the next best experiment, and in some ways, maybe even better. So here's the experiment that we actually did. Instead of using live mice, we made mice. So here's a picture of my postdoc, um, Sasha Veneri, who, along with an undergraduate from Harvard, Joanna Larson, um, made hundreds of plasticine um, mice. Um, half of them were painted dark to mimic the mainland mice, and half were painted light to mimic the beach mice. Um, now, this experiment, in some ways, as I mentioned, might in fact be better than using live mice, um, because here the only difference in these mice is their color. So they're made from the same mold, they all look the same, they all smell the same. Whereas live mice, the beach mice and the mainland mice may differ, let's say, in smell, in escape behavior, in activity patterns. So here the experiment completely focuses on the difference in color and not correlated traits. But the downside of this experiment was, would it actually work? Could we actually fool predators into attacking these uh, plasticine models of mice and not live mice? Well, I wouldn't be telling you about this experiment if it didn't actually work. So what Sasha did is she released 
equal numbers of these light and dark mice in both light and dark habitat where live mice um, of, the, of the species actually occurred, and then counted predation events. So here's a predation event. So what you're looking at here is a dark mouse that was put out on light soil, and you may notice that it's missing um, part of its left ear and it's got a big um, chunk taken out of its back. And this is a classic predation event. And in fact, not only can we tell that it's been attacked, um, but we can actually say something about who's doing the attacking because these marks are consistent with an avian predator. So um, here's the results of the larger experiment that Sasha did where she was counting up the number of predation events in different habitat types. So um, what you're looking at here are the results of this experiment. So let's first focus on this um, far panel of the light habitat. And what you can see is there's cryptic and what we'll refer to as non-cryptic um, mice. And these, um, these bars indicate the relative level of predation in both of these uh, two types of mice in this particular habitat. And what you can immediately see is the level of predation here in these cryptic mice is much lower. Um, in fact, it's about half of non-cryptic mice. So what that means is both mice were um, attacked by predators, but the mismatched mi mice were attacked about twice as often. Now when we look in the dark habitat, we see um, a very similar pattern, but in reverse. Here we can see the dark mice survived um, much better, and about um, they st while still attacked, they were attacked about half as often as the mismatched mice. So what this first thing tells us is that color seems to matter. Um, and in fact, it matters a lot. We can take these numbers and sort of translate that into a selection intensity. Um, I'm not going to go into details about this, but let me just say that color matters um, uh, a great deal for these mice. And in fact, mice that match their habitat have about a 50% increased uh, chance of survival compared to those that are mismatched. And the final thing I want to say, as I mentioned, we can tell in some cases um, who's doing the predating. And about half the attacks were due to avian predators, and about half of the attacks were due to mammalian predators like coyotes and foxes. So together what this experiment is telling us is that the differences in color variation are tightly linked to the environment, and that its uh, natural selection is playing a role in driving these color differences.